Good morning. Uh, my name's Laura Carter, and we're interviewing uh, Charlotte Thomas Marshall this morning in the gallery at the athens Clark County Library uh, as part of the Reflecting Sharing Learning Program. And we're excited to have Charlotte as part of this series because she's a longtime resident and a very active and vital member of the Athens community and has been for many years. And we're going to start off and I'm going to find out how she got here. So tell us first of all where you came from and how, um, what your early life was like. Mm -hmm. Well, I was born in a small town in southwest Georgia, Donaldsonville, in 1941. And I grew up with my horizons in rather close. Uh, I just didn't know anything about this wonderful world outside of my wonderful world. And it really did take a village to rear me. And I love my village very much. But when I wound up in Athens, I learned to love this village, this town, this city very much. Uh, I went to Wesleyan to college. That was my mother's idea. I was part of the generation that did what mother and daddy said do. And when I graduated from Wesleyan, I was prepared to teach as my daddy insisted I be. I could major in anything, but I had to be prepared to teach because that was the world of women mm -hmm. in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but while I was applying for a teaching job and deciding between the two that I was offered, Wesleyan offered me a job traveling the state of Georgia primarily, but then outside of Georgia as well as an admissions counselor. And since th those two and a half years, I've said that was my real education because uh, it taught me all about uh, organizing my time, uh, reading maps, doing my itineraries, uh, navigating, all sorts of things. And uh, I traveled with a pack of people in the fall uh, doing the college night programs, and Mo Phelps was the father of the college night program. He was the director of freshman admissions here at the university. And after two and a half years, he and Claire Swan talked me into coming to work for the university because Claire was resigning uh, to give full attention to her baby. And that is how I landed in Athens. I really thought I would be in Athens two or three years and then go to Atlanta. The small town girl had to work up a nerve to go to the big city. <laughs> but I never got to Atlanta. After I'd been here 11 months, my co-worker, Karen Carruthers, was having a covered dish supper for all of her friends who did not go to Auburn to the game that year. And one of her co-workers, I mean, one of her uh, friends was George Marshall. And we met that night, and three weeks later we were engaged, and five months later we were married. So Athens became my permanent home because George loved Athens and the University of Georgia. And he did not want me to work. He wanted me to be free to do what he wanted to do. He had been previously married to an Athens native and had stayed close to her family and they adopted me. And this is how I got interested in Athens history because they were very interested. And in particular, they were interested in the Oconee Hill Cemetery. And they needed somebody to edit the cemetery records. They had led the effort, Aunt Frances, Marion's, George's first wife was Marion West, and her mother was Ruby Robinson West, Miss Henry West. Judge West had died many years before. I never knew him. Uh, he was a judge of the Superior Court, but um, they wanted me to learn about the cemetery, and they had led the effort to do the survey of the cemetery uh, to replace the records that burned up, destroying the first 40 years of cemetery history. And once they got the survey completed, there was nobody who would take on the job of editing it. And 
Aunt Frances had a cerebral thrombosis after George and I had been married almost a year, and Ms. West was walking around wringing her hand saying, oh, France is going to die and the cemetery records will never get published. Well, I had gotten bored in this length of time. I was not yet caught up in the life of Athens. Um, I, I was not yet a volunteer. So I asked George if he thought I had enough sense to edit cemetery records. I, I was an <laughs> English major. I was somewhat literate, you know. And he allowed that I might. <laughs> so that, that's how I got into Athens history, was uh, editing the cemetery records. Well, some, one of Aunt Frances's friends had kindly made type scripts of all the film notes. Well, I knew what happened when I made type scripts. Numbers got transposed, uh, initials got uh, mistyped and so forth. So I made an index card for every tombstone and I went to the cemetery and checked all the tombstones. And in standing in the lots, I saw which families had intermarried. And I would come home and say, oh, so-and-so is kin to so-and-so, and I'm learning what not to say to whom. Uh, it was very valuable background training for Athens. And, and my mother and her father had this natural knack for family history and family connections, and I seem to have inherited it. George would tease me and say, well, Charlotte can go to any family reunion because she can talk anybody's family. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So that's how I got started and how I got here and got interested in Athens history. <laughs> well, you're kind of known as the cemetery lady for Oconee Hill. And I always tell people that you know all the dead folks. That's right. And how they're related to all the other dead folks. And that's because you did that work. How did you get started writing? Writing. Well, I, in the midst of all of this, I was invited again on the strength of the West family to be a member of what was then the Athens Junior Assembly, now the Junior League. And they had just taken over the Taylor Grady House as their headquarters. And they needed somebody to research it. And they decided in their wisdom that I was the person to research this. I'd never researched anything like that. My mother had wanted me to, but I had steadfastly avoided it. But when the assembly told you to do something, you didn't have any option but to do it or resign. And after a few rebellious moments, I knuckled under and started researching the history of the Taylor Grady House. And I didn't realize at the time that they had really thrown me in my briar patch. And for anybody who hears this and doesn't know what that reference is, I grew up having my father read Uncle Remus stories to me. And there you will understand what being thrown in your briar patch is. Uh, it's landing where you are the happiest and the most rewarded. Uh, but I didn't know it at first. It's interesting how we resist what ultimately is the most rewarding to us. And through being assigned to do that, I uh, became much closer to Mary Bondurant Warren, who I had already met through Mrs. West, because Mary Claire and uh, Marion were contemporaries and friends. And, but this meant that Mary Claire became my mentor in historical and genealogical research. And also, I had to go to the Special Collections Library at the university, and Mrs. Tate took me under her wing. I had gone through college avoiding spending much time in the library. This, this is a real <laughs> hoot when you know me now. Uh, I, any book that was on reserve that meant you had to sit in the library and read it, I learned that if you were at the library 15 minutes before it closed at night, you could check it out overnight if you would have it back when they opened the doors the next morning. So that's how I read all the reserve books, because I smoked at that time, and I didn't want to sit in the library. <laughs> 
and go into nicotine withdrawal. I'm a very lucky person to still be <laughs> here. Uh, so um, Mary Claire and Mrs. Tate became my mentors, and I met many other lovely people around Athens who were connected with the Taylors or the Grady's who shared their materials with me. And I'm just sorry now that I wasn't savvy enough to ask them more things because I was as green as green comes. Uh, there was Miss Leela May Hull, who was also Mrs. Hannah Harris. For a long time, I thought she was two different people <laughs> until I met her because Ms. West and Aunt Frances would say, well, Leela May, this, and they would say Leela May Hull, and then in another conversation, they'd talk about Ms. Hannah Harris, and I really did think they were two different people. <laughs> you, you have to just really get immersed in a town and learn the people to know that people are still called by both their maiden names and their married names, and you got to know both of them. And, but Miss Leela May had me come around to her house, and she pulled out the family Bible that had a pictorial se section. Oh, cool. I mean, all these court receipts yeah. that w were the people that were the contemporaries of the family that built the Taylor Grady house. And I'd never seen anything like that, but I didn't really realize how privileged I was to get to see it then. And then Miss Leela May died, and I didn't know where that went. When I was finishing up editing The Tangible Past in Athens, Georgia, I was including my grown niece in uh, Gwinnett County in some of my emails, and the fact that we were dedicating the book to uh, Henry Hull and his son Augustus Longstreet Hull. And she wrote me back and she said, you know, one of my college friends that I still get together with annually is a Hull. And I think I'll send her this email that you've written. And I said, yes, go ahead. If she's connected, I'd love to know. Well, lo and behold, her husband is connected and they have some of the pictures that were in Miss Leela May's Bible. So she is scanning them and going to send me the digital images. Amazing. Uh, it, and the the whole journey of editing the tangible past was one of continual surprises and discoveries uh, that we didn't even know to ask people for and things fell in our lap. Some of the things that we worked so hard to find we never found. but other things that we didn't even know to ask for just came out of the woodwork. Isn't that kind of the way history works, though? I guess. The way, I mean, hasn't that been partially what happened when you did the Oconee Hill Cemetery book? The the big one, not the original not one the that got you started, started but the one the, you did later for yeah. Athens Historical, that the first volume. Century. Mm -hmm. The book, yes. And, uh, and it has evoked so much more. It, what you know after you've published the first thing is that it's going to bring forth more information that you so wanted when you were writing it. When the Athens Historical Society decided back in 1986 or 87 to do historic houses, and that was to be solely a videotape project, but then they decided they wanted me to do uh, a handbook to go with it. And I had to do, I had a lot of research, that's why they asked me, they knew I had uh, research on the houses, but you always have to go back and do more. It, what you've got is never sufficient. And I couldn't find deeds for some of those houses, but I wrote my hypothesis about what I thought happened about the trainer house. When the book came out, somebody gave a copy to Bessie Mel Lane and she wrote me a letter and she said, your hypothesis is exactly correct. I have the documentation to prove it. And she sent it to me. The, and so I had, I've had that to use in subsequent things. And that door opened another door and people have just been so generous. At, and I try to return the favor by helping other researchers because there's no way you can 
ever adequately thank those who help you except by passing on the favor. But you have been very generous because I know when I was in the heritage room, you would always say that we could share your email or mm -hmm. your phone number with researchers mm -hmm. to help. And we always would jokingly tell all these people who came from out of town, well, she knows all the dead folks, so let's put you in touch with her. Now, you know, and, uh, Milton was teaching a course at the Georgia Center, Athens, um, historical and anecdotal. And I took the class on a tour of Oconee Hill. Afterwards, Milton said to them, Charlotte doesn't know these people are dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> because I, I know in a lot of cases, the relationships, not just the kinship relationships, but how they got along with each other. Um, what their business relationships, their social relationships were. And uh, sometimes it's very amusing to me who's buried next to whom <laughs> over there. And I, I wondered if they knew they were going to wind up that way. Exactly. Well, tell me a little bit more about some of the other books. You did, um, you and George edited the book that Susan Tate had done Susan yeah. when good Francis Barrow Tate. Tate. Right. Um, well, first of all, when I was president of the Athens Historical Society, Larry Gully, who was with the Hargrit Library. I remember Larry well, right. good friend. Yes, and I really miss him. Um, he suggested that we do the Susan Barrow Susan Francis Barrett Tate Fund, and he and Linda Aaron were very helpful in launching that. And then out of that, let's see, Goodlow Irwin uh, was later president of the Historical Society, and he was looking for something for the Society to publish, and he knew that Ms. Tate had a number of essays that had been published in the uh, Athens Observer and the um, different magazines. So he thought it would be nice to do a collection of her essays, and he asked George and me if we would help her with editing it. And that was a most rewarding occasion. And Mrs. Tate was legally blind by that time, so in order to let her know what we were doing, she had a most retentive mind. I, I will never have the kind of mind Ms. Tate did. But in order to let her know what we were doing with her text, I would uh, record myself reading her manuscript as edited, and she would listen and tell me what to do with it. And we just had a joyous time working together, and I learned so much. And she had one or two other essays that she decided she wanted to write in the process of compiling those essays, and I helped her do the research for those since she couldn't get out and do it herself then. And as I would bring her in the tidbits and she would integrate them all and tell me all the related stories, and there's a word that really wasn't a part of my speaking vocabulary before that book. I, it was part of my reading vocabulary, but plethora. <laughs> <laughs> and she had two essays on her great aunts, but one of them was a plethora of great aunts. And quite often, out comes the word plethora in my conversation now. And I always pause and smile and think about Miss Tate when I say that. I learned a lot from Miss Tate. Well, uh, she had lived here a long time, and she knew a lot of people. And her husband knew a lot of people, and oh, that. Yes. But her family had been here for, forever, forever. And when, when the Athens Historical Society did the historic house pro houses project, one uh, aspect of that was doing a video session of four Athenians uh, remembering. It was called the Remembrance Session, and it was Mrs. Tate, John Stegman. Uh, Gosh, I'm going blank now. Oh, Kenneth? No. Ken oh, no. Cohen? No, Mr. Bondurant. Mr. Bondurant, John Bondurant. Mary uh, Claire's father. Mary Claire's father. And then uh, Milton's mother was to have done it, but she got sick and he got her cousin 
to do it. Um, Neighbors? Nope. Oh, okay. Brain went dead on that one. I'll think. But, I, I but can, we, you can I, tell I, me I, later. I, I can see her. She's a Cobb descendant, and uh, just a lovely, fun person. So they 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 were having this remembrance session together, and it went on for a couple of hours, and just has all sorts of wonderful. The raw tape of that ought to be preserved somewhere. But then we decided that we would, Jane Agee, who was the president of the Historical Society, decided that we should take uh, takeouts of that and do a program for the membership. And we didn't have a studio or anything to work in, so we worked in my den. And we would play and back up and play and back <laughs> up, marking where we wanted the agars to cut it for us. And George was up at the other end of the house in his study and finally he came down the hall and he said would you tell me why Mrs. Tate who was born here and has lived almost all of her life in Athens speaks with a Tidewater accent and I'd never George was very keen in picking up on accents so we brought her out to see what we had done with the thing before we presented it to the membership. So I asked her the question, and she said, well, my mother had typhoid fever right before I was born, and she was too weak to look after me. So her mother, who was uh, Susan Lucas, uh, reared me for the first three years of my life, and she taught me to talk. And Susie had been sent to school in Maryland. And there they had taught her to speak with a Tidewater accent. And Susie died when Miss Tate was three years old. And that really shows the, of course, Miss Tate's mother was Susie's daughter right. and had been taught the same thing. So she was still in that environment. But she said that Susie taught her to walk too. And she said, and I walked just like Susie did. And when Mrs. Tate went to Lucy Cobb, they tried to get the tide water out of her speech, but they could not. So, right. so it, it persisted. And I just think that is really amazing to show the impress that somebody can have on a child for in those short number of years. Well, you know, Academically, they've decided that you know 80% of everything you're ever going to learn by the time you're five. So that she I'm just absorbed that. <laughs> she just absorbed a whole yeah, lot. She did, and she grew up in an adult world. I, I loved her essay about World War One that she was sitting under a table playing while her uh, granddaddy, the Chancellor was talking with the neighbor and they were talking about the war coming and she felt that it was coming right in on her <laughs> underneath the table. the table. The war is coming. <laughs> well, she was an exceptional lady mm -hmm. brain-wise and with what she did for the collection at Hargret. What's mm -hmm. now Hargret, it wasn't. No, it was special to special collections. Yeah. And Communication reminds me of something that I want to say about n research and now. When I was getting started and my mother wanted me to do family research, she pulled out the letters that she had written in the 40s after World War II, asking questions of the older members, the distant cousins in her family, what they knew about this ancestor and the other. And one of them wrote her back, said, Lord, child, you ask too many questions. <laughs> and, and Mama was using that as a teaching tool to me to not overwhelm an older person with the number of questions. And so after that, I started, I typed, uh, and I would leave a space for them to answer the question so that they did not have to organize a letter uh -huh. to answer my questions and they could just dispense with them however they wanted to and I got answers back. Um, 
Your mother was a wise woman. Oh, she was. She really was. And and she started early. I, I all in my family research. It's all built on what Mama did. I, uh, and my daddy loved his living relatives, but he was not one whit interested in ancestors. <laughs> and so when Mama married Daddy, his parents were quite elderly. And because it was a second marriage for each of my parents, and I was not anticipated, I was the unexpected caboose to the family. Uh, and Mama interviewed Daddy's parents and made notes. I still have her notes, uh, and that's what she and I built on in later years, researching the family and. We finally made breakthroughs, but it sure was hard. I kept saying my people moved to counties where they knew the courthouse was going to burn, just so it'd make it difficult for them. <laughs> but back to communications, I started off with stamps and self-addressed return envelopes and waiting for the answers. And I was always forthcoming with what I knew, and I learned after a while, I am sometimes a slow learner, never to give everything I had up front because once they got everything I had, they quit answering me. Mm -hmm. So I would send some of what I had and ask them some more questions, and I'd say, and I have more information when I hear from you. And that's the way I finally got out of them what they could share with me. Right. And all researchers need to know that by whatever means they are communicating. If you give it all away in the first burst, then you aren't going to ever get what they can give to you. It's just human nature. So uh, then the Internet came along, but I did much of my research before the Internet, and just as the Internet was opening up, I was in my main phase as a caregiver and had no time to do genealogy or to learn to use the internet. So it was 2003 before uh, I went online, and I've been very slow learning. Now let's go back to how many books have you helped publish and edited and done? You've done the guidebook to that went with the video that okay. Anthony's Historical did on historic okay. houses. Okay. You did you did editing on those early Oconee Hill Cemetery books that well, were done well, that were I not as complete. Well, well as I did the first Oconee Hill book in the eighties. Right. And it it was just a straightforward uh, transcript of the inscriptions. On one part of the cemetery. Yeah, on the early part, the yeah. original part of the cemetery, because that's the part where the records had been lost. Right. The records are intact for the part across the river, or as Pete McCommon says, the trans riparian part of the cemetery. <laughs> Love that word. Um, so that, that was the purpose of the Athens Historical Society's copying and surveying the cemetery in the 60s, was to try to replicate the lost record. Of course, you can never do that. Mm -hmm. If the person did not get an inscribed stone, we don't know they're there right. unless some family member came forward and told us. Right. that Grandpa was buried over in that corner, but we haven't ever marked his grave. And that ev is even going on today. There are people who are buried there, but there's no marker. Right. Once that temporary marker from, and so those records are critical. Yes, uh, the, the sexton has the records of who's buried s since uh, the fire in a one, and I, I kind of think a, t uh, a sexton who did not get reemployed torched him. Uh, circumstantial evidence points in that direction, but we won't mention his name. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, he's the only one who ever wrote his autobiography. Oh, I, interesting. I find fascinating. Uh, but as you say, there are people in the new section, and by new, that is new since 1900. Right. So it's 115 years old now. And 
that did not have markers put on them. And it's not just for lack of funds, I've decided. I think some people just don't feel it necessary to have a marker uh, because there, I, I, when, I, when we did volume one in 08, is that when it came out or 09? I'm confused. Um, I, it was my intention to do the whole cemetery then and I, that was just how little I understood how much was going to be how involved much information. In, in doing that. But I started work on all different sections of the cemetery and I discovered that one section that Gary and I had just finished surveying when I was matching up the sextant's records with what's on the top of the ground, there was one lot that we thought was vacant and there were four people buried there. Mm -hmm. And the father was uh, had retired from the university. So he had uh, benefits. Supposedly, there would have been plenty of money, money. to have bought Marcus right. if that family wanted him. So I just have to think it was a philosophical matter with them not wanting. Or just never getting around to it. A yeah. lot of us just procrastinate that and we never true. get everything done that we know we ought to do. <laughs> and so um, and yeah. so that, I think, is a reason for a lot of it. Like you say, there's money, but they just never get around to yeah, around getting to it, it done. Cause, and the other piece of that book that is so important and has made it so unique, Charlotte, is that in addition to just the names and the dates, and you know, now the trend is to go through the cemeteries and you also put the GPS coordinates, mm -hmm. but you've found obituaries or in entries from city directories or you've added so much texture and richness to those individuals that would not have been there if you just did a standard cemetery book, which is why volume one is how many pages, 600 or something? Yes, it's 650, I think. Yes. Yeah, when I was finishing it and I told Mary Claire how many pages it was, she said, you can't do that. That's too many pages. And I said, well, that's how many it is. And there weren't any I was willing to get rid of. It, it took that many pages to tell what, and now I've got more information that could have been in there because it's always for We'll just do an addendum. But um, <laughs> it's important to me to know who those people were and what they contributed to the fabric of Athens. So my explanation of what I did with that book is that by annotating the people and taking things from their obituaries or other sources, I make them people again and then if you read the whole thing you get an unorthodox history of Athens. Except it's a more complete one than a standard right. history. But it doesn't have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Exactly. <laughs> and things that have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end scare me off because that requires too much concentration and planning and that's why I think the organization of the tangible past in Athens, Georgia, as an example to other people who want to write about either their town, their church, their mm -hmm. family history, it, it can be used as an example because if you do essays about whatever aspect one individual knows, knows. and then compile the essays, you've got a treasure trove without having to organize beginning, middle, and end. Well, and you get a richer texture, mm -hmm. and because you index it so thoroughly, it's not like people have to read the whole book to find what they may be looking for. And they can read the chapters mm -hmm. they want. But I did talk to a number of people right after they got your book, and they said, I sat down and didn't go to sleep for three nights because I read the whole blooming thing cover <laughs> to cover. And I went, I haven't even opened mine. I better not until I have time to read it. <laughs> well, one of my neighbors said she took hers home and read it, the whole thing, and has been in therapy ever since. <laughs> 
Now, nobody I talked to was in <laughs> therapy. They didn't find it that traumatizing. <laughs> they just found it fascinating, uh, and they said so much about Athens makes sense to them now. Well, that's that they never hear. understood before because they weren't necessarily born and raised here, although they may have lived here for 40 years mm -hmm. or so. They just never understood why some of the things happen in Athens the way they happen and why some of us are the way we are. And they said reading that book explained a lot. Well, I, I, I love to hear feedback on the book because everybody gets something different mm -hmm. from it. And I don't believe I've ever had a more exhilarating experience, rewarding experience, than working together with the writers. And, and not just the writers, uh, the contributors to that book, because there were some people who met with us who did not wish to write, but they knew things that they shared with us that went into the book. Uh, and some of the writers didn't choose to meet with us, but we prevailed on them to write about what we knew they knew. knew. And we all had different, some of us had the same mentors, but all of us had some different ones. Right. And it just made a rich tapestry, and I like to refer to the book as a chorus of voices. Uh, That's a good description. Mm -hmm. That we've got all these voices telling us different things about the Athens they love, and that's what was so exhilarating is to be in a room with people who loved the same subject that you love and they knew something you didn't know and they were telling you. And then a question would arise and you would all sit there and puzzle over the answer to it. And I want to go back to this communication business that I didn't finish a while ago. Have an email greatly enhanced the development of this book because we would be working on something after we were separate and a question would arise and so we would get it out to the group mm -hmm. and it would be batted around for a day or two with people contributing and speculating and so and we would finally resolve it right and th it didn't take a meeting to do it and maybe they would pull in other voices to contribute to it. And that kind of forum is just invaluable. Yeah, email, that ability makes life much simpler mm -hmm. to compile information and aggregate information, I think. Um, the book we didn't talk about so far is The Postcard History of Athens, oh, Gary's where you book. and Gary Doster used his extensive postcard collection and of just Athens. He's done postcard books of other places in Georgia. Yeah, he's taken all the sections of Georgia and done separate books. And then he did, the first one I think he did with his postcard was Abbeville to Zebulon, right. which is also a fabulous book. But what I loved about this book that was different than most postcard books I've ever seen is that y'all used ex extensive captioning and you actually researched a lot of things and corrected some myths and found new information that people had not published before based on his postcard collection. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, it's really Gary's book. It is Gary's book. It's Gary's book. But, and both of y'all researched, but right. he had to have help just like he helped you <laughs> That's right. in the cemetery. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he walked every step of the cemetery with me, uh, and he's ready to do it again as we crank up to do the rest and of I'll the And I'll help now that I'm retired. Well, good. It's very interesting to walk uh -huh. the cemetery. And we will find new tombstones for people that have been buried a long time because family comes back and mark and they them. they found but them, yeah. About Gary's postcard book. Well, um, Gary had started it, and then he knew that I had accumulated a lot of research on things that would be in there, so he was welcome to whatever I had. And as always, there were things I didn't have answers to, and he and I jointly researched right. it. And in his writing, uh, really, George was the editor of that. He, he, Gary and George worked closely on editing that. 
And then what made that such a beautiful book was Bill Reeves did the um, graphic design on it because that was the first book that any of us did that a graphic designer did. It's beautiful. And it is a beautiful book. And I was so moved by what Bill Reeves said because he was a graphic designer at University of Printing. And he said so much of what he did was for a specific occasion and then it was going to be discarded. And this was something that was going to be kept. And that had such meaning to him to work on. And um, so, yes, I, it, I, I thoroughly enjoyed working with Gary on the research for um, his postcard history of Athens. And it is much more than just a postcard book. It is a history book. And we were interested in getting it right. Uh, Gary's a stickler. Mm -hmm. and yes. And... Uh, and I like He's, he and you have kept me on my toes yeah. for a lot of years. <laughs> well, we, and, and and we like to get it the story, our history, right, and get rid of myths. And sometimes we get rid of things that we didn't know were myths in this. In the tangible past, we suddenly discovered that that building that for a hundred years had been called the law offices of Tom Cobb and his father-in-law, Joseph Henry Lumpkin, were never the law offices. <laughs> Tom Cobb built that as a girls' school. And, and I found out who got us all mixed up, my good old friend Sylvanus Morris. <laughs> he did do some... Yeah, this. Sylvanus has wonderful stories in his strolls about Athens uh, in the early 70s. But you got to watch him. You can't swallow him whole. Look. Well, he's got a brain like mine is now that has a lot of misinformation floating yeah. around or things got confused. You, I think. you take him as a springboard and yeah. then you go document what he says. And if you find out you can't document it, then you better let go of it or you're headed right. down the primrose path. I've headed down it several times right. before. Right. Uh, um, uh, but he's very valuable because when we were trying to write something about the James Jones Taylor House across the street from the Taylor Grady House, it's now a parking lot. It's not there. We did such wonderful things yes. in this town to our buildings. But but we have saved a lot. Laura. We have. We have, and and I want to get this on record. If it if we weren't a university town, if we didn't have sororities and fraternities, we would not have no. these antebellum homes. We would not. It takes their dues <laughs> to run and these their ability houses. to pay taxes. That's and right. That kind of thing. Yes, it, uh, we we wouldn't have all of these antebellum homes because it's just too big of a maintenance problem for an mm -hmm. individual, mm -hmm. and that's why. That's why we lost the ones that we did because the homeowner couldn't afford to keep it up anymore right. and they sold it for what they could get out of it. Okay, when I could not remember the fourth name doing the remembrance session for Historic Houses of Athens a while ago, uh, it has winged back into my brain and it was Mary Stark Bowers who was the fourth participant in that session. And when we left off just now, we were talking about the history of the James Jones Taylor House across the street from the Taylor Grady House, and the fact that John Cassane wrote that it was built as a great revival house, but later had this very expansive Beaux-Arts facade added to it. And since I had no background in architecture, I wrote John an email and I said, John, will you explain to me how you know that that facade is not original to the house? Because I know the Taylors did not have the money subsequent to the war to change the house. And he said, well, Charlotte, it's because that style of architecture did not exist until the late 1800s. And I said, duh. <laughs> <laughs> So it was the late 1800s, early 1900s, 
that, and we had several examples of that kind of a facade. Uh, there are two on Millage Avenue now, the Lipscomb, the Marianne Lipscomb House, I can't remember, and the uh, house that was built by the Fennessees that's at the corner of what was State's Rights, now Henderson, Henderson. and uh, Millage Avenue. Those two houses have this kind of facades. But this had a colonnade as well. And so when he told me that time period, I then turned to Hull's Annals to see if he mentions that in the walkout prints. It's not. So I turned to Mr. Sylvie, to Sylvanus Morris. And Miss Tate called him Mr. Sylvie because he was her next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. And um, he said that John A. Fowler lived in that house. But he didn't say anything more about John A. Fowler. Well, I have learned in using Hull's Annals and in Sylvanus Morris, if they tell you something and don't elaborate on it, that there's a reason. Because they elaborate on other things. And that always, that now that I've learned that, it raises my curiosity, and I'm bound and determined to find <laughs> out about that person, why they didn't tell me any more about the person. So I have the name John A. Fowler, and now we have the digitized newspapers in Athens, and it covers that time period, and I'm not turning up anything about the John A. Fowlers. Well, this was the most elegant house on Prince Avenue. And wouldn't you think they would be in the social news? Nope, not mentioned. Just And they aren't buried in Oconee Hills Cemetery, which is my springboard for right. finding out people's biography. And um, I, I was nine plus, so I called in Teresa Flynn, who uh, you, she was with you in right. the Heritage Room for years. And when Teresa goes after something, she can find it. Well, Teresa f turns to the 1880 census and she finds John A. Fowler as a retired bartender, age 28. Very remunerative work, wasn't it? Right. He was living up in Hall County, but almost immediately she finds him buying land in Clark County. And he's buying it around the periphery of Athens because Athens instituted its own, oh Lord, there went dispensary. a Dispensary. No, it didn't, that wasn't oh, the dispensary. This, the this, dispensary. this is before the dispensary, that, but um, prohibition. Oh, okay. They instituted their own prohibition. It wasn't for Clark County, it was just for the city, city of Bay. Athens. That, Which was much smaller then. Yes, so he bought land around the city limits of Athens and set up his bars. And the newspapers were complaining, the city fathers were complaining <laughs> about all this money flowing out of Athens. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and he got very rich. And, uh, and so he had his own distillery. And uh, Teresa located where the distillery was. It's somewhere between the Athens Country Club and the Stockade. There's a lot of springs in there. Yeah. So he had pure spring water to make his corn mash liquor. And we have his advertisements in the Athens newspapers. Uh, so I presume his money was considered tainted because it was liquor money. but. It put this elaborate facade, facade on the house. He married around um, the 1890s, and he married a woman from uh, Washington, Georgia. And they are buried in the Catholic Cemetery in Washington. I was in Washington this past Saturday for the celebration of the Battle of Kettle Creek, and I wanted very badly to go to the Catholic Cemetery, but we just didn't have time. I'm going to make a special trip because I've got to find out where they are buried. Uh -huh. But you see, in the late 1890s and the early 1900s, being a member of the Catholic Church was bad. Was, it was not, uh, the doors, the society open. just didn't open to you. So here they gave us one of the most glorious landmarks on Prince Avenue, but there's not much written about them in Athens. Well, the chapter on 
that was already formatted when we made this marvelous discovery, and I couldn't begin to ask Ken's story to tear up. It's a 97-page essay, and this is right smack in the middle, and I couldn't ask it him. It could have been its own book, yes, actually. Yes, yes, and what somebody could do now is take that and write about what is there and have a book. Right. That they could use the same format mm -hmm. for what is there. But I couldn't begin to ask Ken to tear up all of his formatting, so we had to put it all in the caption to the pictures. And you're talking about packing words. We really had to pack to get that information in there. But And that came up right at the end of writing the book. So, And you'll continue to get more information, because yes. once you put it in print, everybody that you've been asking for information for decades will come forth and tell you everything you got wrong right? and that they weren't included. Well, but until you put it in print, they don't tell you diddly squat. Well, we've had several people come forward and thank us for doing the book, but at the same, in the same breath saying how disappointed they were that their family wasn't in it. And I have very gently tried to explain that people wrote about what they knew and that the book was basically about houses, streets, communities, and that we just didn't do the street that their family lived on. And the fact that we did not treat Millage Avenue is a huge exception. Mm -hmm. And we knew two years, three years before the book came out that we weren't covering a lot of things that deserved to be covered, but we knew the book was already going to be big enough. Mm -hmm. And we kept saying, that's for the next book. That's for the next book. And um, this book was so enthusiastically received, which has been a great joy to me. Because you never know till a book comes out whether people are going to like no. what you did or not. No. Um, that Milton is already planning the next book. Well, I was going to ask you about that. When is volume two of the trend, um, the, tangible. the tangible past of Athens coming out? And have when well. is Oconee Hill Cemetery volume two and three and, and four. four coming out? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, Oconee Hill volume one is, is the same size as the tangible past. Right. And after packing over a hundred boxes of the tangible past to mail. And after hauling 38 pound boxes of books to all the stores in Athens between Thanksgiving and Christmas repeatedly, um, I said, I think I'll turn to light fiction. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but you can also do you know, the print on demand and do them where they order them and they get mailed to them. So you can you can do less print copies and let people deal with it on their own so you're not having to lift them. I'm, I'm a, well, I, I had to turn my house into a warehouse right. and a shipping department. I have no living room and That's the room. appeal of the new digital right. publishing. Right. This is why people are doing that. And uh, that may be how the cemetery books come out. But that's what I'm going to turn my attention to, is finishing Oconee Hill Cemetery, because a lot of people have been waiting yes. for that. Me included. Yes, because <laughs> your, your family's in, in volume two. And I, I think I had thought I could do that in two volumes, but I believe now it's going to be so much information I need to do three vol volumes to finish Oconee Hill. And I've told Milton that uh, I think it'll be wonderful to do another volume of The Tangible Past, but I'm not the editor. Uh, editing is not what I enjoy doing. It's very demanding work. And I researched everything that's in the book after the people wrote it. I went back. To make sure it was to, correct. If my name was going to be on it as editor, I wanted to vouch for it. So I, there's a lot of me invested in that book, in addition to my search for those images that we had said, we want images that haven't been, been seen published. by the public. And I think that's part of the joy of the book, that people spend so much time looking at it, because there's just new pictures in there. But I told Milton that I'm very much interested in writing 
for the next volume, and I'd be happy to collaborate on Millage Avenue. Uh, and I want to write an essay about John William Barnett, who was the city engineer. He was brilliant. Brilliant. He was Just an brilliant. absolutely brilliant man. Mm -hmm. And one of the historic preservation students a number of years ago wrote his master's thesis about him and his work. And the other brilliant engineer we had, oh great, now I went blind. It's catching. Yes. Well, <laughs> I think I already had it. I gave it okay, to you. Okay, talking about Nicholson the, or? Um, Strahan. Oh, Strahan. 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 Mm -hmm. I never get that pronunciation right. But he was another brilliant engineer. Yes. So Athens was blessed with these two brilliant engineers yes. that did all kinds of cool stuff. And it would really be nice to have more information about both of them and what they did. And Marianne but, Hodgson, in her essays, does touch on Strawn because he's a Hodgson family connection. But And she did a separate little publication about him. I don't know whether you have this in the Heritage Room or not. Uh, she did a lot of little publications through the years. And I have hers on Charles Strawn, and I'll be glad to make a copy for the Heritage Room if it's not in there. Well, if it's not under copyright, depending no, on I when don't, she, she did it. No, she didn't copyright it. She just did okay. it sort of like a Christmas present to her okay. friends. Okay. And what Marianne was interested in was, was preserving. Preserving. And what her es she did three essays for the tangible past, and her essay on the reuse of architectural elements is just a beautiful essay and really couldn't be written by anybody else now that Marianne's gone. Well, she had such a sharp um, mind, mm -hmm. um, very detail-oriented. She was a very quiet, low-key person until you got to know her, and she was soft-spoken, but Lord, what she knew. Yes, and the what, trees of Athens. Because uh -huh, that whole project and the fact that we now have a tree advisory board is all due to Mary Ann Yes, that, that was a passion of hers. And the fact that we have in the appendix of the book about the streams of Athens, mm -hmm. she was behind that in the Junior Ladies Garden Club and provided mm -hmm. that material to go mm -hmm. in the book. Uh, and she was just invaluable, and uh, I'm so sorry that she didn't live to see the reception of the book. Right. But um, she did try to document people that would not have been written about otherwise, except for her personal knowledge of them. Mm -hmm. it's a, it's, Athens is an interesting place, and I'm sure every place is. It's just that we've been blessed to have people who are interested enough to dig deeper and then publish it. Right. Yeah, and I'd like to say this about Athens since it's my adopted home. Athens is different from any other place in Georgia. It was founded as the home of an institution of higher learning. Now, we had other places that were founded for the same purpose, Penfield, down mm -hmm. in Greene County, mm -hmm. Midway in Baldwin County, and Oxford over in, um, went blank? Newton County. Newton County, thank you. But their institutions all went somewhere else. After the war, Mercer went to Macon, Oglethorpe went to uh, Metro Atlanta, uh, and Emory went to Decatur. Mm -hmm. We stayed in Athens. And from the inception of Athens, people were flowing in here from other places. Mm -hmm. So we were a diverse population from our inception, and we were not founded as a market town, as all the other towns in Georgia were founded. And a town founded for commercial purposes has an entirely different philosophy spirit, mm -hmm. everything about it. We, we were founded for education, and the fact that people came from different places, 
they had a tolerance for one another and the fact that they were educated, they had a tolerance for differences. And that is what I experienced when I moved here, is you could be different. You could think differently and still be accepted. And when I mentioned this to George, who loved Athens better than any place, he loved his native place, Americas, but uh, he loved Athens. And although he was offered nice opportunities elsewhere, this is, is where, where it was stayed. for him to stay here in Athens. Well, but again, thank you so much for doing this. I think you've given us some good insights into Athens and into what it takes to research a local history because I know that over the years you've used personal documents, journals, newspapers, cemeteries, and deeds. Oh, yes. So without Tax using digest. all of these various <laughs> yeah. documents, you can't really do an accurate local no. history. You, you've got to have the primary documents. And as good as the Internet is for ha uh, accessing a lot of stuff that other people have already brought together that needs to be regarded as a springboard and you need to mm -hmm. go document it yourself.